Tonight, delicate diplomacy. Prime Minister Narendra Modi walks the tightrope in balancing relations between Russia and Ukraine as he meets with Volodymyr Zelensky. Asina grounded, the former Bangladesh Prime Minister and members of parliament have their diplomatic passports revoked as the caretaker government attempts to hold the leaders accountable. Harris's promises. On making her acceptance speech at the DNC, Kamala Harris framed her vision for the future of America, one that according to Trump is sorely lacking. Mindful inventions, soft and stretchable jelly-like strips could be the key to providing electric power on and even inside human bodies. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Aquil Qureshi. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight on World News for the final bulletin of this week. I'm Aquil Qureshi and as we wrap up, for the, we've got lots of fresh updates and key stories from across the world and we start off in India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi arrives in war-torn Ukraine today after a 10-hour journey from Poland abroad Rail Force One. This marks the first visit by an Indian Prime Minister to Ukraine at the invitation of President Volodymyr Zelensky. The trip comes just weeks after he met Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. The visit is significant because Kyiv and some Western capitals had reacted sharply to Modi's visit to the Russian capital in July. Mr. Zelensky was particularly critical, saying he was disappointed to see the leader of the world's largest democracy hug the world's most bloody criminal in Moscow. End quote. The country's famed non-alignment approach to geopolitics has served it well for decades. Today's visit, the first by an Indian Prime Minister to Ukraine, is more about signalling that while India will continue to have strong relations with Russia, it will still work closely with the West. The timing of the visit does reflect that Indian diplomats have taken on board the sharp reactions from the US to Modi's Moscow visit. India has refrained from directly criticizing Russia over the war, much to the annoyance of Western powers. Indonesia's parliament decided to postpone proposed amendments to electoral laws following intense protests in the capital. Demonstrators set fires and clashes with police who responded with tear gas and water cannons. The protesters around the new legislation would undermine political rivals of both the outgoing president and his successors. Security forces used tear gas and water cannons to disperse protesters who breached and set ablaze part of the gates of parliament, television footage showed. The protests were sparked by a battle over which government agency has ultimate jurisdiction in determining election rules. The legislature, dominated by supporters of outgoing President Joko Jokowi Widodo, was set to vote to reverse changes to election laws made by the Constitutional Court on Thursday. If successful, it could have blocked a vocal government critic of the president from running for the important post of Jakarta governor. The move would have also paved the way for Jokowi's youngest son to run in elections this November. Indonesia's deputy parliament speaker told deliberations will continue in the parliament's next sitting period, meaning there would be no change for this year's regional elections, scheduled for November. Jokowi leaves office in October. Students protesting on Thursday vowed to fight on. Analysts say the wave of protest comes amid mounting anger with what is seen as the Jokowi administration's attempts to consolidate power. Bangladesh's interim government has decided to revoke the diplomatic passports of ousted Premier Sheikh Hasina after she fled a student-led unrising earlier this month. All the former ministers and members of the parliament have had their passports revoked. She's facing 31 cases against her and nine fresh cases was filled and filed this week. 
The move to cancel Hasina's documents leaves the former autocratic leader in potential limbo and comes on the same day that a United Nations team arrived in Dhaka to assess whether to investigate alleged human rights violations. The Interior Ministry said in a statement that Hasina's passport and those belonging to former government ministers and ex-lawmakers no longer in their posts have to be revoked. It also poses a diplomatic dilemma for Hasina's current host, regional powerhouse India. Hasina, who fled to an airbase near India's capital New Delhi, was a close ally of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, whose Hindu nationalist government preferred her over her rivals from the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, which it saw as a closer to a conservative Islamist groups. While India is hosting Hasina, Modi has also offered his support to the new Bangladeshi leader, Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus, who is heading the caretaker administration. More than a dozen people in Bangladesh have been killed and 4.5 million affected by flood triggered by heavy rains in the country's east, as per the Disaster Management and Relief Ministry. Footage showed residents in chest-high flood water near their homes in the western Kamila district. In Habiganj district, the strong currents of a swollen river were seen gushing past flooded houses amid continuing rain. Road connectivity in several regions was severed, isolating communities and hampering relief efforts, with forecasts of continuing rain raising concern about additional flooding and displacement. An analysis by the World Bank Institute estimated that 3.5 million people in Bangladesh, one of the world's most climate vulnerable countries, were at risk of annual river flooding. Scientists attribute the exacerbation of such catastrophic events to climate change. Thailand has reported a suspected first case of the new and more transmissible strain of Mpox, which was previously known as monkeypox. Authorities confirm that the patient is a European man who had recently travelled to Thailand from an African country. The patient began displaying symptoms and immediately went to hospital. It has since been confirmed he had contracted monkeypox and in particular the strain known as Clade 1B. At least 450 people have died from the Mpox in an outbreak centred in the Democratic Republic of Congo which started last year. It has since spread to a number of nearby countries including Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda and Uganda, all of which were previously unaffected by Mpox. The infection in Thailand is the first confirmed case of Clade 1B in Asia. Let's take a short commercial break. Mobile news after this. On the road to the White House tonight, or making her acceptance speech as at the DNC, Kamala Harris has told voters they have the chance to chart a new way forward as she framed her vision for the future of America. She cast her opponent, Donald Trump, as an unserious man, but warned his election as president would have extreme serious consequences. In this theatre of politics on Chicago's west side, it was day four, defining for a campaign and a career. It was a party convention far different from the one they would have had had Joe Biden not stepped down. He looked on from a distance. For Kamala Harris, this was the speech of her life. Something they'd never seen in theirs. A woman of color asking America to make her president. I promise to be a president for all Americans. You can always trust me to put country above party and self, to hold sacred America's fundamental principles from the rule of law to free and fair elections to the peaceful transfer of power. We heard of the young Kamala Harris, brought up by an Indian mother who crossed the world alone. She also taught us, and never do anything half-assed. <laughs> and that is a direct quote. <laughs> she styled herself a commander-in-chief, who she said would contrast with Donald Trump. I will not cozy up to tyrants and dictators like Kim Jong-un, who are rooting for Trump. Who are rooting for Trump. They know Trump won't hold autocrats accountable because he wants to be an autocrat himself. 
on foreign affairs, she said she would stand strong with NATO, and she addressed the Middle East. I will always stand up for Israel's right to defend itself. The current vice president spoke of Gaza, solutions, and her role. Again, the scale of suffering is heartbreaking. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has blasted Vice President Kamala Harris over his speech at the Democratic National Convention. The vice president promised to reform the country's immigration system, vowed support for Ukraine and promised to lift the middle class. The former president, however, challenged Harris's claims that she is the answer to America's problems. He said she didn't mention China, fracking energy or Russia and Ukraine. The former president posted several criticisms on Harris during the speech on several issues. He posted that there are 60 million people in poverty in the US under Biden's watch and the Democrats failed to acknowledge it. In other posts, Trump put a spotlight on how there was no action behind Harris's words, claiming she had three years to put the plan she touts into effect. During the speech, Trump referred to Harris as a radical Marxist and said she stands for incompetence and weakness while the country is being laughed at all over the world. Now that both conventions have come to a close, the election heads into the final stretch two weeks before absentee ballots are mailed into the voters in North Carolina, a key state. Venezuela's Supreme Justice Tribunal ratified President Nicolas Maduro's victory in July 28th presidential election, sealing institutional backing for the ruling party as a disputed contest faded from international headlines. After weeks of heated dispute, Venezuela's Supreme Court has certified President Nicolas Maduro's election win. The vote sparked deadly anti-government protests followed by what human rights groups have called a crackdown on dissent by Maduro's administration. There have been arrests of opposition figures and protesters, along with forced resignations of state employees with alleged pro-opposition views. On Thursday, Chief Justice Carislia Rodriguez said the Supreme Tribunal had reviewed material from the electoral authority and that Maduro's win was valid. The opposition party, however, says the Supreme Court has no constitutional right to carry out any electoral functions, making its ruling null. The opposition, led by Edmundo Gonzalez, had published election results which gave him 67% support. The electoral authority said Maduro won just over half of the votes, but has not published full tallies. Many Western countries have urged full publication of the results. Thursday's Supreme Court ratification gives Maduro, who took office in 2013, Another six-year term starting in January. Hundreds of Ukrainians from Pokrovsk and nearby towns were evacuated yesterday. They're leaving the Donetsk region in eastern Ukraine for safety in the west of the country. Advancing Russian troops have caused a mass evacuation of the civilian population. Provosky is the strategic location due to its intersection of roads and railways. Ukrainian volunteers helped move those who could not move themselves on Thursday, ahead of advancing Russian forces in the eastern Donetsk region. <laughs> Maria Moisieva is 94 years old. Her relative, Lyudmila Sidorenko, helps her pack her things. It's not the first time they've been forced to flee. Starting from August 20th, Donetsk regional authorities ordered mandatory evacuation of families with children here in Pokrovsk and nearby towns. The Russian military has been steadily grinding forward in Donetsk, one of four Ukrainian regions Moscow claims it has annexed. But Russia does not yet fully control the territory. Ukraine's losses in the east come as it presses its incursion into Russia's Kursk region, maintaining, for now, its surprise gains. Kiev says it plans to carve out a buffer zone to better defend itself. Video released on Thursday showed Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky meeting his top commander near the border, where he announced the capture of another Russian village. Ukraine's Air Force on Wednesday shared this footage of what it said were strikes on Kursk. The Ukraine's surprise operation, using Western military hardware, 
boosted Kiev's morale two years after Russia's unprovoked invasion. But Kiev's attack on Kursk hasn't relieved pressure on Donetsk. The situation in Pokrovsk and nearby towns deteriorated because the Russian army is advancing and very close to the city. Ukraine's military said there were 46 Russian attacks on the Pokrovsk front over the course of Wednesday. Presidents of the Porto Velho in the Brazilian Amazon have barely seen sunlight in the days as a thick cloud of smoke from forest fires envelops their city. The Amazon suffered a historic drought between June and November last year and this year has recorded more than 42,000 forest fires from January 1st to the August 19th, which is the worst number in nearly two decades. On the banks of the Madeira River in the Brazilian Amazon, boats are becoming stranded. Their movement impeded by sandbars, rocky outcrops and low water levels. Just a year on from Brazil's worst drought in history, it's a foreboding sign and fears are high that this year's dry season could be worse than the last. To make matters worse, vision is obstructed by the thick clouds of smoke that have also blanketed the nearby city of Porto Velho. The city has gone two months without significant rainfall and now residents are struggling to breathe after the region's worst period of wildfires in nearly two decades. According to data collected by Brazil's INPE Space Research Institute, the Amazon as a whole recorded more than 42,000 forest fires between January and August. Scientists have warned that if Earth surpasses the established 1.5 degrees Celsius warming threshold, humanity will face more extreme and irreversible events, such as increased and more frequent droughts and wildfires. Sudanese Health Minister Nahithan Mohamed Ibrahim said that the conflict-stricken nation has recorded nearly 600 cholera cases since announcing a cholera epidemic on July 23rd. The humanitarian crisis in Sudan has worsened cholera infections. With nearly 600 cases reported since July, here is Sudanese Health Minister Haitam Mohamed Ibrahim. <laughs> We have sent investigative and monitoring teams to identify the locations that are contagious, the water in some places and the drinking from the ponds. We have distributed chlorine with the help of UNICEF and the World Health Organization, and we have opened treatment and isolation centers in several neighborhoods in Kasala and Al-Qadarif states. Currently, we are regularly intervening, and in the coming days we will be starting a campaign that offers drinkable water mainly in these states. Al Qadarif health official Mohammed Dawood said the influx of people due to the ongoing war is straining the city's resources, aiding in the spread of diseases like cholera and conjunctivitis. The country is also suffering the world's largest hunger crisis, with some 25.6 million people suffering acute hunger, and the healthcare system is in disarray due to the lack of access to aid in many of the country's provinces. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More World News right after this. Welcome back. Soft and stretchable jelly-like strips could be the key to providing electrical power on an even inside human bodies. Scientists at the University of Cambridge say that the stretchability of their newly developed jelly battery could be used in implants in our bodies where it was previously impossible. Is this a toy factory? And as you can see, it's very soft and stretchable, just like jelly, really. Or a scientific laboratory. With about five of these stuck together, we can then make the hydrogel power source. Researchers at the University of Cambridge in the UK showed CBS News their creation, which they are calling a jelly battery. It's pliable, durable, and could potentially be implanted in the human body to run electrical currents, just like a slimy sea creature. By mimicking the electric eel, we were able to make a power source out of these hydrogel materials which are both soft and stretchy, sort of like our brains. Some researchers say it could be useful in treating diseases of the brain. They can last over several days or weeks outputting power um, to power these devices for things like deep brain stimulation, 
for trying to cure diseases like Parkinson's. Others see the jelly being used to treat problems with joints. With such a new concept, its potential could stretch on and on. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin, wrapping up this week. We'll see you again on Monday with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as we have Anuradha Rikma Singha, who join you on next, of course, on Nike Business Report. Thank you for watching. Good night.